I am a Christ follower. I'm here for anger, sexual sin, and gluttony. My name is Digga. Hey, gang. That's Ann Wilson, um, Sunday Sermons. And I will explain why I picked that song here in a moment. But I, I thought it was a pretty good song. A little bit of revival, a little bit of, little bit of you know, bopping. I'm bopping in the back. If anybody's checking me out back there, I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving. Not very well, but I'm moving. <laughs> All right. Um, so... Two weeks ago, we started the spiritual inventory, and we talked about shortcomings, and the purpose of these two lessons, spiritual inventory one and two, is to help you complete these inventory sheets. Many of you uh, are in a step study right now, um, and are working through these inventory sheets, and probably, if not about to... Uh, discuss these with your sponsor, you're probably getting pretty close to doing that. I know my group, I've given them until June 21st to uh, go ahead and complete this so we can move into uh, the next principle, which would be, pre well, sorry, before we start principle six, that's required. So we've got three more weeks to do that. But Tanya's given, a, again, an exceptional lesson on how to fill out the sheet, the very specific details. You can find that on the CR uh, page on the Harbor Church. It's the first one up there posted. You can't miss it. It's really great, very detailed. This is a little bit more of what you're looking at. So I'm trying to help you dig into some of those sins and shortcomings versus how to fill it out. And as if you call uh, two weeks ago, I talked about we tend to focus on columns one and two when we're doing this inventory sheet. That's the person that hurt me. This is what they did. I'm upset. I'm gonna forgive the person because I have to, but right now I'm upset, right? That's really what we're doing in that inventory sheet. Somebody has hurt, has hurt us. And that's all cool. And you gotta do that. You gotta forgive, okay? Forgiveness should be instant. Anybody that's been doing this Christian thing for a while knows forgiveness is instant. I'm not gonna steal uh, Tanya's thunder on the forgiveness lesson because she gives an exceptional uh, lesson on forgiveness. But forgiveness is supposed to be instant. Now, again, I'm up here. I'm telling you what should be done. Again, realizing, you know, I'm pointing at myself. This is sometimes very difficult to do. It is sometimes to very difficult to forgive people, okay? So here's what I would say. Forgiveness is supposed to be instant. Trust, and again, this is a Tanya thing, but trust is earned. There's a difference, right? So you got to forgive. God says you forgot to forgive. And if you don't forgive, there's a lot of issues with that, right? Maybe the trust needs to be earned and it will take a little longer. So don't get freaked out about this, but get through column one and two quickly because when you're getting into principle five, it's going to be columns three through five that you're going to focus on. And then when we get into principle six, it'll be columns one and five. But three through five are really where the meat is for principle five. So before we move on, we've got to have good inventory sheets. So that's what this is about. All right. So we're going to go through principle four, step four. This is the last principle four, step four. There was five lessons. Somebody's out there counting. I know you folks. Somebody's out there counting going, this is the fifth lesson of five. And we've got two more to go in principle four. We're going to do the confess and then the admit, less, admit lesson here in a few weeks. Um, and then we're going to be done with principle four. We're moving on to principle five. Thank God, because principle four <laughs> takes a really long time. And it is a tough principle. Filling out the inventory sheets and then sitting down with your sponsor. But again, so paramount to your growth and re-recovery. So again, we need to do it. All right. Principle four. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure at heart, Matthew 5, 8. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and the scripture that's associated with us. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. That's Lamentations 3.40. So, two weeks ago, we did the first shortcomings, sins, whatever we wanted to talk, how do you ever want to say that, what we were looking at. We talked about, if you remember, relationship with others. I focused on resentment. That's one of my big issues way back when. Second one was priorities. We talked about, is God really the priority in your life? I think I said he's in my top three. I'm working him up, but right now he's in my top three. I'm just being very candid with you. Again, I, again, just looking at my life, probably not top of the list. Alex, again, I apologize. Alex knows why. 
I might have dropped the four-letter word in here earlier today, and I apologize profusely, Alex. Still have a potty mouth like naval people. Unbelievable. You, you Navy folks. Um, then the next one we talked about was attitude. We talked about a gratitude of attitude. Really important to do when all the craziness is going around you. I've always used what Dave says, gaze at God's glance at the problem. If we do that, boy, we're going to be okay. But it's really difficult. And I know some of you are going through some really difficult things. Again, one of the reasons I selected the song, I thought she did a really good job talking about, hey, we go through a lot of hardships in life, but I'm going to remember that God loves me. If you just go back to that, every time you're going through a challenge, God loves me. He is going to get free through this. He's told me he's going to do this. And I'm going to get to this a little bit more. I'm going to talk about this. My Bible is a little, little tattered, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that here when we get to that. All right. So, and then the last one uh, that we talked about was the, uh, oh, what was the fourth one? Bob, what was the fourth one we talked about? Help me out here, dear. Do you remember? No, I don't remember either, so. That's all right. I'll look, I'll look it up. It's tough to get old. And it was only four. Integrity. Integrity. Very important integrity. We talked about this. You've got to be transparent in, in your recovery, and you make, need to make sure that we're being honest with each other. Some of us are still holding on to secrets. I kept a secret from my wife today. Snuck a cigar. Shouldn't have done that. Felt bad after it. Not shame. I'm going to talk a little bit about shame tonight, but I did feel a little guilty Probably going to have to tell her, I'm not really looking forward to that. <laughs> but the, the secret's going to sit on me, and that's not going to be good. So I'd rather experience her wrath now than just having that sit on my shoulders for days and then confessing. And then what's the purpose? I went through that pain, pain and agony for five days, and I could have just gotten over it. Rip the Band-Aid off. Confess it. All right. So we're going to talk about four more tonight. Um, and then we'll be done with this, and then we'll be moving on again into confess and admit. Okay, the first one, mind, your mind. Let me read the scripture that's associated with your mind. I think it's really good. Oh, what did I? Oh, boy. Okay. I'm not as prepared as I usually am here. I had, I had something here. Oh, boy. Can I have a... Uh... There you go. Well, either thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Do not conform, I want to make sure I'm reading what's here and not in the book. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That Romans 12, 2. Now, again, if you remember two weeks ago, I read some questions. I'm going to go through them again quickly. If you ever really want to get all the questions, I'd be happy to sit down and get them for you. All right, first question. How have you guided your mind in the past? What did you deny? Real simple, you can't think of two things at one time. You can't think a negative thought and a positive thought at the same time. Now, some of you are superwomen. Who was on that text chain tonight? I said all my sisters in Christ out there are superwomen. Where's Derricka? You were on the, who was on the chain tonight? Derricka, did I not say that? All my sisters in Christ and CR, you're all superwomen. And you had to be on the text chain to get it. But I am complimenting all the women out there. You're superwomen. But... You can't think two things at once, even our superwomen uh, in, in Christ here. You, you can't do it. All right. Have you filled your mind with hurtful and unhealthy movies, internet sites, television programs, magazine, and books? That's a good one. Garbage in, garbage out. Real simple. Not a hard one to figure out. All right. Have you failed to concentrate on the positive truths of the Bible? That's the one I want to talk about. Um, look. Some of us have been told lies our whole lives. You're not worthy. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. Um, go on and on and on. You get it. Again, I'm, I, you know some of the things that you've heard in your life. Those are all lies. I chose tonight the song by Ann Wilson because she said in there, and she says it really well, and it's a famous, famous Bible. I'm not going to call it a fable. It's not the right term, but a Bible. It's not a verse, um, but it's something that we learned very early on in Sunday school. Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. It's a song. Thank you. All right. I went to Catholic CCD. We didn't have that. That was not part of our CCD training. <laughs> Anybody that's Catholic knows that. I love, Bob's a Catholic. Are you Catholic? Yep. Oh, I love, I love, we Catholics. We get, there you go. 
I'm a Catholic. You saying that? Well, you're probably, that's because you're in the South. The Northeast, we don't do any of that stuff. Hey, there's none of that, there's none of that touchy-feely stuff in the Northeast. Yeah, 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 we don't do any of that touchy-feely. Yeah, 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 we, yeah, we don't do that in Massachusetts. None of that hugging and singing kumbaya stuff. But on a, but on a serious note, the Bible is the truth. So it's real simple. When you hear a lie, you should be ashamed of what you did. Shame is world. That's the world. That's the world telling you. If you're feeling guilt because you got the Holy Spirit in you and you want to repent and towards, towards God, biblical. Big difference. Being you should be ashamed of yourself. You get it. We could go on and on and on. There's so many lies out there that the world tells us. And simply, you just need to turn to this. You need to spend time in this daily, and you will know the truth. And again, I thought Ann Wilson did a great job talking about Jesus loves She said it over and over again. Jesus loves you. If the creator of the universe loves you, David Towner, and loves you, Bob Marrero, and loves each of you, not loves you collectively, he loves you individually. He knew you before you were born. That is special. He wants what's best for you. So all the craziness that you hear out there, that is not the truth. If you resort to this and you look at this daily, you will know the truth. But even if you doubt it, if somebody says something to you, you got to know Jesus loves you. And he would not say those things about you. Many of you are parents out there. We love our children unconditionally. We tell them things. We, you know, we, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. We tell them that not because we want them to obey us. We've been around a day or two. Now, I am not omniscient, but God is. But I know a little bit about life. I've told my sons since they were little, nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> nothing. He's down in Ebor about a month ago, and his, he was in a car. And he got shot at. The woman he was with did not get hit, but all the shards of the glass came in him. But there was a person about 10 yards or less from the car that did get shot. He came home. He was a little freaked out, but he handled it really well. But a couple of days later, he says, Dad, you always told me (laughs) that nothing good happens after 12 o'clock. And my point in telling you that is, I was telling my son that because I didn't want him to have to work, to to experience that the hard way. I've experienced after midnight the hard way, right? I'm sure some of you understand that. That's not a good place to usually be. Usually I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. So I was trying to give him advice. I was trying to give him my experience. He didn't take it, obviously. But now he knows. That's what we want from our children. That's what God wants from us. This is instructional in nature because he loves you. It's not to put rules and regulations on you and make your life more difficult. It's to make your life better. That's why he put it in writing. He had so many people sit down and put this all together. And it's one story. Christ from the beginning, Christ to the end. Okay? All right. Next. Body. Now, I thought this was a pretty cool one. I'll read the questions, but I thought this was a really good one. (laughs) Tanya's got some great... I kept most of your slides. I took a few out. I didn't add anything in there that was going to, you know, shock you. I was going to put a dog sitting on a cat or something, but I didn't want to get... I didn't want to do that to you. All right. (laughs) Body stuff. Body. I suspect there's nobody out there has ever abused their body. I'm the only one that has binge drink, binge eated, you know, any of those things. I suspect none of you understand what I'm going to talk about here, but, but I will go down this just in case somebody can relate. In what ways have you mistreated your body? It, it, it started right off, abused alcohol, drugs. No, I, I can't do that. Food. Oh yeah, sex. Yeah. You, you know, I've given my wife venereal disease, right? That was a pretty good thing. That, that worked out really well. That worked out really well. Again, was at a place I probably shouldn't have been after midnight. It all falls together. All right. Again, so what have you done to mistreat your body? 
What, again, I, like I said, hey, it's right here in the book. What activities or habits cause you harm or cause harm to your physical health? Like I said, I'm reading this going, why does she give me these lessons? They're, they're killing me. They're killing me. Here's the thing. I wanted to read something for you. Uh, let me see if I can find it because I've been struggling there tonight with fine. Oh, there, there it is. It's in the Bible. All right. I'm telling you. Lucky I got ahead. All right. I want to read this to you because it's got a really good point and it's in the Bible, so it's the truth. When an evil spirit comes out of a man or woman, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is he's worse than he was in the beginning. Now, you've heard us say this a bunch of times out here. Look. Many of us have abused our bodies, drugs, alcohol, sex, food, whatever it might be. If you want to stop those things, you have to replace those with positive things. Working out, walking, Bible, attend a meeting, you get it. You cannot just let it go. Again, I learned this the hard way. I got rid of a bad habit and then picked up binge eating because I did not replace it with a bed. I didn't change anything. I just stopped being an angry dude, yelling at people, jumping at people at work. I didn't stop doing that. I did, it was really a good thing, but I didn't replace it with anything good. I kept my life going, and I ended up being a binge eater for a, a very long time. You gotta replace the bad habits with good habits, or more likely, you're gonna have more worse habits than you started with. Again, I, that's why I'm still here. I keep coming up here and I keep throwing up things. Nobody has ever said, Digger, that, that sounds like a new list. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't keep replacing all the bad habits with good habits. That's what we have to do. So if you want to rid yourself of a, especially something body-wise, and again, I suspect some folks are struggling out there with maybe food, you got to replace it with good things. Usually walking, working out, reading the Bible, calling an accountability partner. You can go down the list. We've got a list of them here, but they'll all work. It's a lot better than binge eating or whatever the eating disorder might be. And again, I sit up here, gluttony. I'm still struggling with that. I'm not, I don't binge eat often anymore, but I'm more gluttonous now. Working on it. Work in progress. Progress, not perfection. All right. Family. I, went, I was telling somebody earlier, I think it was Faith. Yeah, was it Faith? Yeah. I don't know why they did this order. I don't think these are in order because I think I'd put family at the top of the list. If you want to talk about shortcomings, sin, dysfunction, I might throw family at the top of my list. Again, I suspect I'm the only person out there. All your families are totally squared away. Life is going well. Relationships are perfect, etc., etc., etc. You get my idea here. F family should be, to me, it should, should have been number one on the list, but I don't think they put these in any particular order, and I'm doing them in the order the book says, but I would throw family first. Have you mistreated anyone in your family? How? <laughs> Thank you, Tanya, again for giving me this lesson. <laughs> Why I came to CR. <laughs> Against whom in your family do you have a resentment? Again, I'm doing three new inventory sheets. Just three. I, I've been doing this nine years. I've done five-step studies. I got a lot of inventory sheets. I tweak most of them. But usually every step study, I come up with a couple of new ones. I got three. All family. Everyone. That's, that was Jack Nicholson, by the way, Roger. It was a terrible, <laughs> terrible... Terrible imitation of Jack Nicholson, but, or of Roger, for that matter. But, but it, it, really, I got three family members. Now, I know a few people. I'm not the most friendly person in the world. Don't like hugging. You guys know the stories. But all my inventory sheets, three family members. And by the way, three different family members. 
Never been on my family member list. So my wife is not going to be on this. She, she was on the first or second <laughs> list. <laughs> I owed her a few amends. I owed her a few amends. She might have been the first or second inventory sheet. Kids were probably there too. But these are three different people in my family. Family is a tough, tough thing. Look, it, it just, you know, yeah. <laughs> to whom do you owe amends? Column five, what is the family secret that you've been denying, have been denying? Again, I suspect I'm not the only one out there that has family secrets. Um, I just told you one tonight. I'm not sure why I told you all before I told my bride, but I did. Maybe that made it a little easier. I got to chuckle. Maybe she's going to laugh. <laughs> maybe, maybe she's not going to be upset with me. <laughs> Okay. Hey, I can be hopeful. I can be hopeful. We're in the church. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Be realistic. <laughs> I'm in deep, deep trouble. But if you got a family secret, we're better to talk about it in a place that is confidential, anonymous. You can trust the people here and you can get those out. The first secret that I told and celebrate recovery with my first group. It was a hard one to tell. So my dad was in the mafia. So just in case some of you don't know, Dave knows this. My dad was in the mafia. I had an interesting childhood. It took a while for me to, to understand that, but it did finally get to me. Tanya kept bouncing off my head, but my dad was in the mafia. That you can imagine was a little bit of an interesting childhood at times. <laughs> So, and that's, that's the truth, as, as you know, I'm not, I'm never, I never get up here and lie. So there was there's some few interesting experiences in my childhood, but it is what it is. I, again, I'm not in the mafia, and never was, by the way. So, but my point is, we all have secrets. Some of them are difficult, but I'd rather get it out, like my cigar one, than to keep it because it just weighs on you. You can't carry that burden. You got to let it go. And one, but what better place to do it than here? All right, lastly, the church. I love this one. Everybody knows the story. I think I've told this a bunch of times, but there are a few new people out here, so I always like to tell this story. Oh, I'm sorry, let me read the questions. Have you been faithful to your church in the past? Have you been critical instead of active? Have you discouraged your family's support of their church? I did that last one. And I'm going to talk about that. But again, I picked the Ann Wilson song because she said, I thought she said it real, the devil can take me out of the church, but you can't take, thank you, you cannot take the church out of me. And that is so true. At the time, back in 2005, I, and I, was, I had two young children. I had an older child that was in college. And I was trying to be the spiritual leader of my family and doing a really terrible job. I was not going to the Catholic church, it was local. We tried a couple of the Catholic churches, didn't work out. Uh, so we just stopped going to church. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, and I've been going to church my whole life. Um, but I stopped going. My wife decides she wants to go to this church about a mile down the street called Open Water. It's a non-denominational church. I'm not walking into non-denominational church. I'm a Catholic. I might turn on, I might, you know, I mean, God might strike me down. He might, <laughs> he might smite me. You know what smite is, right? He might smite my butt walking into a non-denominational church. That's right. So I was staying out. I stayed out for three and a half months. My wife and my two little children went to church a mile down the street every Sunday. I think they were going back then at 11 because that's when the kids went to, uh, to the group. We had two services back then. Um, and I, for three and a half months, I didn't go. And, and by the way, I kept telling her, this is wrong. You, you shouldn't be going to this church. It's non-denominational. We're Catholics. I don't know what they're doing down there, but I can't go. <laughs> it's a true story. It's a true story. So in January of 2006, and I, and I have a purpose for telling you this. Some of you have heard this, but in January of 2006, I came to this church. And again, things didn't get a whole lot better for me. I got this guy outside, right in front of the church here. He's got this jacket on. It's all patched. His patch is all over it. I'm sitting there with my wife. I'm going, who the hell is this guy? Oh, that's the pastor. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I almost got in the car and left. 
I come into the church. Billy Brown's up here singing. I don't know what the heck they were singing, but I, it was not a hymn. It, it was not a hymn. They were singing all kinds of stuff I had never heard of. I didn't know anything about the Joy FM back then. They were singing these Christian songs. What the heck? And then they've got a TV up here, and there's a TV show called The Lost. Remember The Lost? Any of you that are old like me, The Lost is on the TV. I'm thinking to myself, I am definitely in the wrong place, and I am going to be smitten or smited or whatever the word is. I, I tell you that for a reason. One, I, I highly discouraged for my wife from doing what Christ was leading her to do. And the second thing is, one of the seminal moments in my life was walking into that church in January of 2006. So, if you are not in a church, I highly encourage you to get into community. It will change your life. Your relationship with Christ is this, always going to be this way. But to do this, and again, Dave remembers me. You think I'm weird now and unfriendly. <laughs> uh, like I said, there were, there were empty rows around me back then. That's, it, it was, again, this is a community. And I don't say it enough, but I love you guys. I, I would not come on Tuesday nights to hear if I didn't love you guys. And I didn't love this church and I love Dave and Tanya. Air, air hugs, yeah. Yes, keep your air hugs there. As long as they don't become physical hugs, we're good. There's a reason. You've all, you all know, I've told you the story, right? Why I don't hug. All right, well. Yeah. Tell the new I'm going to keep that a secret. <laughs> All right, uh, another one, yeah, all right, but, but yeah, but, but <laughs> ask my wife. Um, church is so important, um, and if you are struggling with your church right now, or you've got something, we're a church, and there ain't a better church out there. I've been doing church my whole life. I went to church every day in college. Again, if you know Catholic, every mass, it was six o'clock in the morning we went to church. Um, never found a better church. So go to church. All right. So I'm going to wrap it up. You're going to do your inventory sheets. Some things you need to remember. One, you got to do it in conjunction with your sponsor. The first time you sit down to do that inventory sheet, or actually any time you sit down to do that inventory sheet, I recommend you reach out to your sponsor. If you've been doing multiple years of this, then, then maybe, you know, you only meet with the uh, sponsor before you do it the first time, if you will, uh, before you do your first sheet. But I highly encourage, especially some of you folks that are new out there, have not done these inventory sheets before, get with your sponsor first, sit with that person, have them pray over you, ask them questions, get out of your head on this, write the answers, you know, the, the sheet down laterally, go across the sheet. Again, there's no right or wrong answer, there's your answer, all right? Secondly, keep it balanced. Please keep it balanced. I always tell my folks, turn the sheet over. Okay, so my dad did this to me, blah, blah, blah. Turn the sheet over. What did my dad do nicely? Write those things down. You got to make sure that you end on a positive note. Don't let the last thing you write down is something that either you did to somebody or somebody did something to you. End on a positive note and that will help and then, obviously, stop and pray. Lastly, memorize Isaiah 118. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. You're forgiven. You're not going to sit down to confess and ask for your sponsors or accountability's forgiveness. This is about you admitting to that individual so you can be healed which is step five. And that's what we're going to be moving on to in two weeks. We're going to, uh, I'm sorry, three weeks. June 21st will be our next lesson. Next week's a testimony. Remember the 14th, we won't be here. On the 21st, we'll be doing principle four, step five. 
And there's nothing about, it's nothing more important when we start praying for each other and we can heal. James 5, 16, right? That's where this is going. Again, it's a very logical beatitude straight through. At the end, you'll experience the miracle that some of us experienced. So, all right, we're going to do the serenity prayer um, and then go to share groups.